So Stuart, what prompted you to write a book on international disarmament law? I, I think it was clear to us that there was a real gap in the, in the market. Over the last two decades, we've only had two books that have come out on disarmament law. One was quite a personal account by a very experienced uh, Danish diplomat, and the other, uh, which dates all the way back to 2001, was broader on uh, all forms of uh, arms control, but hasn't been updated since. So for us, there was a real gap in the market, and as so much disarmament negotiations and some treaties have been adopted since the early 2000s, we thought there was a real need to take a, a, a state of the, uh, of the, the, um, the legal uh, branch of disarmament law and see where we are. Okay, but how then does your guide bring a new perspective to existing disarmament publications? Well, I think on, on the one hand, it's, it's, it's holistic, so it really looks at the, the five global disarmament treaties, but also on related instruments and treaties. So I think that's really an added value. On the other hand, breaking uh, the different themes of disarmament treaties or disarmament law, actually, into different chapters, I think is really uh, a novel approach. And with that, uh, really, really gives some, some new uh, clarification, uh, etc. But that also, having said that, allows uh, for, for certain really in-depth legal analysis. So I think there's a lot of uh, really legal uh, uh, content really broken down into the details that is really, a, I think, quite an quite a achievement. Okay, but then disarmament is often used as this very generic term to say arms control, disarmament and non-proliferation. Do you cover all these aspects in your book? Yes, but our focus is on disarmament. And by disarmament, we mean uh, treaties and law that focuses on the destruction of weapons. Now, you're right, uh, arms control, disarmament, they're sometimes used as synonyms. Some people say disarmament is part of arms control. Some people say the, uh, the opposite. But for us, the focus was on treaties and law where uh, stockpile destruction is at the heart. And then around that, there are a series of other uh, obligations, prohibitions on development, on manufacturing, on transfer, and of course, on use. But a heart of a disarmament treaty should be the destruction of the weapons. Non-proliferation is a uh, considerably narrower term, and that's about preventing, in particular, weapons of mass destruction falling into the hands of either certain states and, uh, in particular, non-state actors. Okay. And are there any new insights or something you discovered during uh, your research? I think for us, the main trend that we've uh, seen over the last uh, 20, 25 years is a move away from IHL, law of armed conflict prohibitions, purely on use of a weapon during armed conflict, to embracing a more disarmament approach. When the Anti-Personnel Mine uh, Ban Con Convention was drafted in 1997, there were two options. They could have gone for an IHL instrument, or they could have gone for this broader disarmament instrument. And there was an, a, a determination on the part of the diplomats and the uh, NGOs uh, that were supporting the, the prohibition of these weapons, that we needed to go broad. We needed to ban these weapons, not just in the situation of armed conflict, but also in peacetime. And I think that trend has since developed. So we've seen the Convention on uh, Cluster Munitions, for example, and more recently the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. All of them have followed this broader disarmament approach. Okay, then Tobias, how do you see the future for international disarmament law? Well, uh, speculating about the future is always hard, so, so, so you have, I think it's really hard to, to, to say anything concrete. Uh, but I, what I find interesting over the last um, a couple of years or decades even is there, there has been blockages and deadlocks into multilateral uh, fora. Nonetheless, I think the international community has managed to advance and adopt new treaties, new instruments, etc. So I think on the one hand, you see there, there's a rising uh, arms race, especially between the great powers, great power competition that is coming back, etc. So that in terms of disarmament might not look really uh, positive. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I wouldn't be surprised if there are really new ways, uh, be a soft law, uh, being, being uh, uh, I don't know, uh, arrangements between the great powers, uh, or, or smaller bilateral arrangements that bring disarmament further. So uh, there are a lot of new technologies out there uh, that, that should be or could be uh, uh, regulated. There's enough uh, uh, reason to do something, uh, but how exactly that will uh, uh, turn out, that, that's kind of hard to, to say at this stage. So Tobias, you mentioned new technologies. Are there any specific challenges regarding that on the horizon? In our final chapter, we've outlined a series of challenges, but I think there are three weapons or, or technologies that are a particular concern. 
The first is cyber warfare. Now this is not new, but its use in conflict and outside conflict is growing. And I think that's, a, that's going to be a major challenge. The second one is artificial intelligence, autonomous weapons. This is going to be a very difficult uh, obstacle to disarmament uh, agreements. How do you outlaw, destroy artificial intelligence? It's not immediately obvious how that can happen. And then the third one is uh, potentially quite a, a, a small uh, item, but nonetheless a huge challenge, which is 3D printing. You can make weapons in your own back garden and you can make weapons that can kill. Uh, how you deal with that in a disarmament agreement is very difficult. I guess the, the, the fourth issue, which is not a, a new type of weapon, but is the uh, arena in which conflicts are going to be fought in the future, and that's outer space. It is clear that the next conflict could well be uh, fought in outer space and not here on Earth. And we're only beginning to find what the ramifications of that are for disarmament. So who is the book intended for? What's the audience? Well, um, it's a guide. So the question is, what the guide, for whom is it for? Um, we, we really thought this could be for, for people working, practitioners working in the disarmament field on implementation of treaties of instruments, being in international organizations, NGOs, uh, but also uh, diplomats who, who, who work with these instruments and in the diplomatic field, also eventually uh, negotiating new uh, uh, agreements. So, so really a guide that, that is helpful for, for every day's work, but also, of course, uh, for scholars or young researchers to find quickly and accessible uh, uh, relevant information. And to make it as accessible as possible, we decided to adopt a thematic approach. It would have been possible to go through the five treaties, list the provisions, explain them, but actually we decided it would be more helpful to break it down by subject. So we have a chapter on use, chapter on stockpiling, chapter on transfer, on reporting, on verification, uh, enforcement. And we think that uh, the users, whether they be state or, or non-state, will find the answers and will find the guidance that they need much more easily in that thematic approach. The Guide to International Disarmament Law is published by Routledge. It is available now, so click the link to find out more and thank you for joining. <laughs>